Well, thank you very much. I hope you found it really interesting and informative. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this type of work since about 2005 now. Um, and the, the basics are pretty much still the same. Um, but one of the things I've found is the message is getting out more and more, uh, which is good, very positive. But one of the things I wanted to talk to you today about is not really the doom and gloom, the things you need to do to protect yourself, but really one of the things I've come to think about is actually secu security, cyber secu security can give you a significant competitive edge. That's my belief. I actually think that by taking a security approach to developing your business, it can actually improve your business capability. So one of the things I want to do today, just to round off, is think about some of the stuff that we've talked about and you've seen presented, and to really kind of think about how you can use security to improve your business. Okay? How can you win more business? So we think um, security is important. Everybody knows that security is there to protect you. Okay? Um, but so is things like business strategy. You know, you, why do you set a business that strategy? We well, set it so that you can stay ahead of your competition. Right? So you want to protect your business, stay ahead of the competition, drive your business forward. Security is about protecting your assets, your people, is one aspect of that. Well, we believe that at Security Lancaster that security can actually give you a great deal of competitive edge. And when you think about the type of stuff that Mark Lacey was talking about, with regards to that foresight planning activities that we're doing as part of the MSC in cybersecurity, we can actually start to think about how does security play a role in things like government thinking, and therefore where can you target your business to go to take advantage of those aspects. Security is a different way of thinking about business. It's actually fundamentally about putting your assets first, the products the people, the processes, the infrastructure that you have, and ensuring that they're operating in a way that you can actually drive the business forward, but still protect those assets. And that protection may be from internal misuse, external attacks, may be from government forces in terms of the legislation that they set. And fundamentally, you employ good managers because they're good risk assessors inside your organization. They sit there and they say, well, we could do this, and it could have these fundamentally significant impacts to our business, and it could take us forward light years. But actually, it could really expose us and cause us a great deal of problems in the marketplace. And they sit there and they weigh, weigh the benefits of taking forward a potential benefit to the organization against the risk exposure that you have. And cybersecurity is a mechanism by which you can do that. It's a thought process, a framework you can go through to think about balancing risks against benefits to the organization. And that's the way that security professionals should approach cybersecurity. It's not all about, right, you've got a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy a, a blue, a yellow box, and we're going to stick it in your network, and that's going to solve all your problems. It's about, OK, what is your business trying to achieve? What are the things that are important to you? And what is the best way to protect those, but still allow your business to do what it's doing? and even do different things, which is one of the things I'll come on to in a moment. Cybersecurity should not be about getting in the way. It just shouldn't. It should be allowing you, as a business, to work harder, work smarter, and work better. Everybody complains about health and safety. Oh, I've got to do the health and safety check and all this type of stuff. Everybody thinks it's a pain in the ass. But actually, health and safety is there to protect one of the most important aspects of your business and that is the people. And that some of the best businesses are those which incorporate the health and safety approach inside their business model. So they're not just, it's not just a tick box exercise that they have to do every six months to know that they've got their monitor in the right place and they're not going to get a bad back. But it's got embedded in their business processes so that you're actually developing that human asset. You're actually, they're actually learning to work smarter. They're learning to work better. So they're not out with injury, they're not out with sickness. Okay, so it's about business process. It is about assets, it's about putting assets first. And it's a, it's a, a strategy for 
developing those assets, taking them forward, thinking about how we can use them in a, a competitive marketplace. And we've got various types of assets, and I like to classify them as tangible and intangible. Things like people. People are probably the business's most valuable asset. Information. You require information to do business, whether it's regardless of the container, whether it's printed material, whether it's on a disk drive somewhere, whether it's in the cloud. You need information to perform. But importantly, we can use that information and do clever things with it to actually push our business forward, and I'll talk about that as well in a moment. One of the things that we are seeing now in cybersecurity, especially with the cross-linking, is most businesses have some sort of core infrastructure that they need. And importantly, that infrastructure is becoming more and more automated. The networks and the systems that you have now control the lights in your building, now control significant parts of your infrastructure. The ability to attack that also can now create physical issues for your company. And that's something that you need to seriously think about. But at the bottom line, your company is there to make money. And the way that you make money is via selling products or providing services. And again, one of the core, uh, the core things about cybersecurity is to go away from the technology and think about actually how do we protect that product and that service. Just because we are being attacked, having a cyber attack, does not necessarily mean that we should not be able to provide the service that our company is built around. We should be able to be resilient against that particular attack. And as you've seen, Lancaster has experience developing resilient systems. So we're well placed to comment on that. But it's this idea of putting the service and the product first, and building the security around that to support that, keep that product or service out there despite you being under attack, is vitally important. And that starts to reflect on your intangible assets, business reputation. I'd say business process arguably is an intangible asset. There's things that you do and you have documented that your business processes, and then there's actually the way things work, right? And those are the real business processes you need to protect. And it goes back to your tangible assets of people. You know, one of the things when I t talk about penetration testing and, and advanced persistent threats, and I talk about people when I'm teaching. Because the person you go after is the secretary. You don't go after the boss because the secretary is the one that makes everything happen for the boss. Right? They're the ones that has access to the diaries and to everybody else inside the organization. They have an informal set of business processes which are loosely based on the documented ones. And it's the ability externally to be able to work out what those informal business processes are which is very useful for then being able to attack a system. Through the research we do, and importantly, the partnerships we form, right, we, we challenge the underlying perception of this cybersecurity as a thing we have to bolt on to be able to do something and uh, provide conformance. We want to work with you guys to actually take it forward to make sure that cybersecurity is not just the thing that you bolt on to the side of your business, but it's an important part of your business, and you use it to help develop your business. So, there's this concept of protection plus, okay? Cybersecurity discussions are dominated by protection of assets. You talk to most specialists and they're like, okay, we need to protect this particular data asset on this human asset or this piece of infrastructure and this is how you do it. The problem is it becomes very difficult to measure the impact of that. You know, if I introduce a new product or a new service, I know it's going to cost X and I know it's going to return Y or I hope it's going to return Y and I can measure that. But with security, part of the issue is I spent X but nothing's happened because I should have spent enough and put it in the right place to make sure that nothing does happen. So how do I measure that I was successful or not? It becomes incredibly difficult. Is it because I spent that money or is it because that type of attack hasn't occurred anymore? So, you know, that you imagine you spent £20,000 just at a time when most of the spam houses were taken down. Was it that £20,000 that you spent which reduced the spam income or spam intake into your business? Or was it because all these international spam houses were taken down? It's very difficult to work out how much money you spend um, trades off to a, a sort of, a, a, an advantage inside the organisation. One of the things it can help you with, again, is obviously this idea of IP and IPR protection. 
Um, but we think it can, can provide this competitive edge and reduce your fines down as well. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But it is more than that. It can make you profitable. And some examples of that, and I'll go into more detail, is this idea that now we're seeing demands in the supply chain for you meeting certain security requirements before you'll get contractual uh, sign-off. So if you want to go and work with you know, large defence contractors, you now need to demonstrate that you are compliant in order to do that. Now say you're an SME that is a four or five man band manufacturing, you know, producing nuts and bolts, for, uh, specific nuts and bolts for the nuclear industry, and now you're told that in order to be able to contract with them, you have to go through ISO 27001 certification, that's a big overhead for a group that has no experience of trying to secure IT, and the only reason they use IT is for their email and to process orders. Okay, so that's a big area. So you need to understand how you, where you are in the supply chain and how you can process that and how you can use security to leverage that. Another approach is to differentiate products. You can use security to differentiate your products in a, in a marketplace. So you're not a primary security provider. You're somebody who produces bent metal okay, for the manufacturing industry. How can you leverage the understanding, the knowledge in, that we're developing in security science to differentiate your product in that marketplace? Okay? And I've got an example of that as well. But we can also think about how we diversify your business. Take what you were doing before and allow you to create brand new products with the same type of infrastructure you have, but using security as a different way of doing that. So thinking about protecting yourself, differentiating your product, doing more, and uh, completely diversifying your business. So if cybersecurity is a business strategy to handle your assets in these areas, it must show that you can win more business, and it must show how you develop these new business concepts. And hopefully I'm going to... Fingers crossed, prove that to you. So, more of the same. You need to do it better. Utilize a secure business model to build up your engagement from the start. Okay? Thinking about security from the outset. Thinking about the protection of your customer. Embed that into the core. If we go back to the Internet Security Breach Survey of 2010, one of the big standout pieces of, of that report that was produced by PwC was that the, the supply chain is a big problem. And I don't just mean the supply chain where you're in it and you're, you're providing a service, but going back to the cloud discussion, you're a consumer of those services in a supply chain, in a supply network. Now, suppose you outsource your business to Google for all your documents, okay? And now, BAE Systems has come to you and said, we would like to contract you with you, but what I want to do is make sure that you're certified 27,001. How do you manage your documents? Oh, well, we go to Google. Okay, have you got, in your contract with Google, they, they've, they're 27,001 certified for that service? Who here knows whether the, the outsourced service provider they've got at the moment is in any way, shape or form, certified for security? And who in any way has thought about whether that knock-on impact to your upstream co uh, contracts is going to have? You know, it's a big, important thing. You need to think about that in, in terms of the, the, the ecosystem you operate. Certification of practice. Again, differentiating in a marketplace. If you turn around and say, well, I'm certified, and somebody else isn't certified, and you're both bidding, you know, and you've got equal contracts, what are you going to go with? You're probably going to go with the one that can prove that they can do more. It helps you push forward your business. It also helps you protect against losses. You know, we've seen this morning discussion about the, the, the ICO and how that they're coming down more and more. One of the big changes for the ICO was the fact that they can actually fine. Now they have teeth, and now they're coming after you guys to make money. Right? No offense to the ICO, but they can get money from you. Now think, even the smallest business has quite a significant customer supply database. You have to, to be able to survive contacts database. What happens if you accidentally lose that? Is there 10,000 records in there? All with personal details in there? Not only could it be commercially embarrassing to you, but it's going to cost you money because you're going to be fined. 
And again, we've seen loss of IP as a significant issue in terms of revenue loss. Competitors coming in and stealing your IP, getting to market ahead of you. We've had a situation on, on campus, one of the, the companies that was, it was co-located here, they suffered a significant number of attacks from unknown foreign agencies after their competitive edge. And through access through the Graduate Academy and the staff that we've got here, they managed to remediate that. Okay, so they managed to discover that attack and present, prevent any further losses. And that's important. You need to be able to understand that. We've seen that. But let's do something different. We can use security to diversify. We can build a different product that you couldn't have done before. From things like moving away from you know, just a general mobile application to a trusted mobile e-commerce platform, for example. Thinking about one of the examples I was talking with some people earlier on, fibre to the home using quantum key distribution for banking. What about utilising security data mining approaches, approaches to identify key suspects in an investigation, but now utilising that with your data to be able to identify key customers and their buying patterns? Just because we're ident building and identifying algorithms that can do social network analysis to identify certain types of behaviour, to identify certain threats, doesn't mean we can't then take that technology and apply it in a different way to help you do something better with your data set. Big data is a big area. Differentiating products is going to be key. In a cluttered marketplace, how do you demonstrate that your product is better than somebody else? Can security provide that for you? Um, and so an example of this is this company and um, very simple, put QR codes on every single one of their uh, additives bottles. And so now, anybody with a mobile phone and an internet connection can take a snapshot of that QR code and get a health and safety data sheet for it. Very simple application of some technology that has improved the safety of that product immensely. Everybody has access that, to that. Everybody has a, pretty much a smartphone, everybody is online. We can do the same type of thing with your existing products with security technology. We can help you differentiate your business. But the key to it is people. And we need to start to change the way that people think about cyber security. We need to start thinking them that it's about a thing that we have to do to protect ourselves to getting them to start to think about it's something that we do as part of our business process. It's a way that we engage, it's a thought process that we use to engage with our customers within the business itself. People are the biggest asset, by far. They're incredibly difficult to replace. They create and they produce everything that you sell, from services to products. And it's often the people you don't necessarily think about are the ones that are going to be key if they get lost. The World Trade Center was um, a key to this. You know, the, 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 the towers, the twin towers went down and the, the business continuity plans kicked in. And by and large, most of those organisations managed to get their infrastructure back up and running incredibly fast. The thing they could not replace was the people. So their businesses failed because although their infrastructure came back up, they failed to protect their people. Okay, so they could not return to business Although we did, they did everything they could to get their data networks up, backups recovered from remote sites, they could not get the people in fast enough to help restore the business. So we need to stop thinking about security as a lock and, some, and start thinking about it as a business process and a business opportunity. You know, what would happen if I secured this? What new markets could I enter? So the way that we approach this within, within Security Lancaster is we kind of got sort of these uh, three areas that we th sort of think about in terms of the way that we can work in partnerships. We can think about the technology approach, access to facilities that we can afford to set up and develop, whereas a small business you might not be able to develop. Think about the product uh, pipeline. You can think about development and validation of your product. If you've got a product that is at the cutting edge, it may be so far beyond existing 
certification approaches, that it, they're meaningless to apply to your product. So where would you go to say that this product is okay? Could you come to the university and talk to you know, some of the people in our academic center of excellence to say, have a look at that and review that and think about that as a, as a way forward? And the other thing I've spoken to a few people about is flipping this idea about IP generation. You know, should universities be generating IP? Patents. Or should universities actually turn it the other way around? Start taking your IP that you've got sitting there you don't know what to do with or you don't have the capability to develop and letting us work with it and see if we can do something interesting. Can we move that on for you? And again, you have a large amount of information assets there. Can we help you to do something interesting with your security information? To engage, to do something much more market constructive? Can we help you with business directly? We have a lot of resource inside the university. Can we help you with new venture creation or capability? Can we help you sit down and think, well, actually, you've got a really cool idea, but you, you don't have the resource or time to develop that. That's something that we've got, we can have expertise in and help work with you on to see if it's viable. We can use the type of stuff that Mark's presented, this foresighting idea, business planning idea, looking broadly at all of these concepts to see whether, you know, or what the future is going to be like and whether your product can play in that space or how you should augment your product to, to adapt to that particular space. The university is a large organisation and it has significant international reach. You can work with us and we can use those channels to help you get to areas that you may not have been able to, to access before. I was talking to somebody earlier on about utilising our links overseas to help provide localization services for their products. We've got student campuses in a range of countries. How can we get you involved in that and utilise those services to give you access to that capability? But one of the fundamental things that, that universities do is generate knowledge and the way that it contains that knowledge is generally in people. Both explicit knowledge, you know, the what, and the tacit knowledge, the how. And universities can be seen as a people pipe pipeline. And we'd like to work with you to help educate that, that future. You know, those future generations of staff that are going out, make them business ready. And we've got various schemes in place, the Graduate Academy, um, challenges that we're setting up to help that. We're educating future employees in a range of areas, technologists, engineers, managers and leaders. We don't necessarily just want to have people that can come out and make you a widget. We want people to come out and think about where that widget can be used and how it could be used. Okay? We want somebody to come out and think about that um, the business opportunity for you. And in addition to that, it's not just about us taking new, making new employees for you. It's about us potentially working with you to help upgrade your existing employees providing them with cutting-edge training, providing them with understanding of cutting-edge technology. Those are all things that we can do within our partnerships. So what are the opportunities? So obviously, as you've heard, we're at Centre of Excellence. We have substantial funding to help you through things like ISIS and ISTEP. And you know, as, as Nick mentioned earlier on, please come and find us if you want to engage through that space. But we need to know what you need. You know, there's no point in us thinking, oh yeah, well, an SME, well, they need an X, if that's not what you need. The only way that we are going to be successful, and what has been successful in ISIS and ISTEP, is engagement with the SMEs and them telling us what you need. And we're going to have to do the same when we start to go down this security route. You've all taken part, hopefully, in a survey um, around security issues. Please, if you can, fill that out. Um, and we're going to be publishing that later on in the year as um, basically the survey results. But it identifies what is really happening in the Northwest. What are your security pressures? And then based on that, the university can position itself to help you to challenge those. We're also thinking about working out how the university can respond 
specifically targeted in the northwest around the, the challenges that are proposed in the, the, the Internet uh, Security Breach Survey from, from this year. Um, because that's a st strategic business view and we want to be able to position ourselves again to be able to respond against that. We're developing educational and research programs. So we've got our existing master's degree program which is cross-cutting um, and not just about technology but again positioning people to be able to go into that leadership space. We want to be able to develop people to tackle those future problems, not just the problems that you're facing now. So we're thinking about how do we develop security leaders? How do we develop the strategists? How do we develop the entrepreneurs of tomorrow? But we need you guys to come in and feed that back to us. We need to know the types of things that you're seeing now so that we can help position ourselves to help solve the problems in the future. We're exploring the future uh, of, of cybersecurity through the work that we're doing here in research work, the, the security futures theme in Security Lancaster, really trying to understand the issues that you're facing. But the reason why we're doing that is in order to drive innovation and industrial engagement. You know, there's no point in us understanding the future if we don't do anything about it. And importantly for us, we want to co-design and co-deliver. Our starting point is we're all clever people doing interesting things. Doesn't matter whether you're in business or in academia. But what is the best way to share that? How do we share that? How do we get you guys to come in and do the, describe the best things that you're doing? And how do we come and work with you to describe what we're doing? And work with you to really push forward those boundaries. So in summary, we can't solve this in isolation and we need your input, even if you're not a security company. There's a couple of people that have identified, you know, you're potentially a producing company, you've got an existing security product, but most of you, or some of you in this room, will be consuming security products, antivirus, firewalls. We need to know what challenges you're facing so that we can help to develop solutions in that space. But also, very intriguingly, is this idea of differentiation, this idea of diversification. How can we help to enable you to be more competitive by diversifying your products, by differentiating your products through security technology? We're interested in developing the people to tackle the next generation of problems. And we are going to do that by tackling the, the problems of today. We are on a pathway a series of trends going forward. We need to understand those trends, we need to deal with them, but we also need to set ourselves up in a position so that we're, next year, five years time, ten years time, we have got the right people in the right place that can tackle these. And that's through generic skills, transferable skills, leadership skills. I mean, from my own personal experience, as soon as I'd finished my undergraduate, everything I'd learnt was pretty much defunct. Technology had moved on so fast. So, yes, there are some core technology that you need to understand, but actually, by the time you hit the workplace, it's going to be those transferable skills which are important, those leadership skills. So, in summary, if you have an interesting problem and nobody else can help, then give us a ring. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>